Good evening and welcome to Women. Tonight's topic, taxes. Yours, mine, and how some of us are discriminated against. With me to tell all is Martha Yates. Martha is the author of Coping, a survival manual for women alone. She is a freelance writer and lecturer and an occasional employee of the Internal Revenue Service. Martha, welcome. Thank you. Martha, is it important to keep records? Yes, it's very important. Every little important. thing, I know so many people who keep every little slip of paper. It isn't necessary to keep every little thing, but um, a cancel check will not do it as far as record keeping is concerned. You do need receipts. Now, for instance, on mileage, it's good to keep a log, the mileage when you leave home, the mileage when you get back, so forth on a business trip. Receipts, restaurant receipts, receipts for gifts, receipts for entertainment, and so forth. Some things you must keep, but not everything. I've been studying forms in preparation for your visit. They're and intimidating, aren't they? Incredibly intimidating. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me it's time for another Boston Tea Party. Right. You've seen all, all of the changes in right. this year's forms. Uh -huh. I, am I crazy, or is it getting incredibly complicated? It's a little more complicated because this year everybody will have to do some computation of taxes. For instance, on the new 1040A, commonly known as the short form, um, on the back of it, line 13A, first of all, you have to be very careful about your filing status. And that's explained on the front of the form. Single, married, filing joint re return, married, filing separately, unmarried, head of household, qualifying widow or widower. And then you have to be very careful about that because when you go to the back of the form, you have to go to a certain line depending on which filing status block you check. And then you have to do some arithmetic. Take a percentage of another line and so forth and work it on. The um, multiply the number of exemptions by 750, for instance. You remember last year we had the $30 per exemption right. allowed this year it's been raised to thirty five dollars or two percent of another line so there's a great deal of arithmetic involved it isn't as simple as it used to be i can see everyone with their pocket computers mm -hmm. right going crazy they'll need them yeah. ten forty i hope everybody got one for christmas D does everyone have to file no not everyone has to file anyone let's start at the bottom with unearned income, interest income, um, young people who have savings accounts and so forth, if they have interest unearned income of 750, they would have to file. Um, the rates are different for different categories, of course. A single person under 65 who has gross income of 2,450 would have to file. And it goes on through the various categories, head of household, so forth. Married filing jointly, uh, if both are over 65, for instance, uh, gross income of $5,100, and you have to really look and see in which category you fall. But uh, when you consider 2450 as the lowest in these categories, practically everybody does have to file. And even if they don't have to file a return, they may want to file to get a refund. Mm -hmm. If they're entitled to a refund, don't have to pay taxes. So practically everybody in the country does file a return. I know it's easy for you to know uh, all the forms. Not necessarily. But, but for the average person, is it hard to know which form to use? Yes, it is. The simplest, of course, is the 1040A, the short form. Then another common form is the 1040 used uh, when you itemize and mm -hmm. so forth. Then for the itemized deductions and interest, you'd use the AB, Schedule AB. Those are the commonest. Most people know those. But it can go on into such things as an retirement income, which has another name this year. If someone is getting royalties, as I am from a book, I'd need a Schedule E. There are forms for moving expenses, child care. There are forms for just about everything. An effort has been made to cut down on the forms, but it's almost impossible. Well, you must have several forms. Uh, how many forms Me? are you going yeah. For a filing season, 1977, I'll need the 1040 because I'm itemizing. I'll need the AB because of the itemized schedule, interest income. Because of my royalties, um, Schedule E. I'm going to income average, Schedule G. Um, I made some gifts, that's Schedule 709 if I remember correctly. Schedule C for my business expenses. Uh, it's very complicated. It can be. I mean, I'm going to have a sheaf of 
things like that send, to send in. You're going to have to take a week off. I know. I will, literally. Is it important to budget? I know the thing that happens to almost everyone is you're caught mm -hmm. and you realize that you have a big <coughs> amount of money to pay to the Internal Revenue Service. Yeah, the ideal, the ideal of course is to have had enough taxes withheld from a salary or to have paid estimated taxes during the year so that you will not have to pay a large sum come April 15th. But it doesn't always happen. People's income can change. They can earn royalties or get a pension or a number of things so that their income increases and they have to file an estimated tax then hopefully to make up for the tax they haven't paid. But um, not everybody gets a refund, of course. Most people do have to pay taxes. The ideal is to be able to break even. And budgeting is the hardest thing in the world to do. I think it's hard in any circumstances. The government has set guidelines. They recommend that a fourth of your budget be allocated for taxes, a fourth for food, a fourth for housing, a fourth mm -hmm. for insurance, miscellaneous, and so forth. Uh, I think realistically, when you consider federal, state, local, sales taxes, gasoline taxes, you're probably paying more than a fourth, but you can be pretty safe to work with a fourth. Even a fourth seems like a lot. I know, it is a lot when you think about it. A fourth of everything that you earn, that's 25 cents out of every dollar that is going for taxes. But I think it's more than that, really. Is there any rule of thumb so that you know how much to withhold, to have withheld? Uh, the best thing you can do is look at a 10, uh, a W-4, uh, a person who's working, for mm -hmm. instance. And I told you it's new this year. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the back of it, it isn't as simple as it used to be. Nothing is simple anymore. You have allowances, extra allowances for credits, allowances for itemizing, and so forth. There are a lot of allowances that people are not aware of. For instance, uh, a single person with one employer can take an extra allowance, can take an extra allowance for dependents and so forth. A lot of people like to have as little withheld as possible, but I think you have to be realistic about it too. And probably last year's income, last year's taxes would be the best guideline to go on unless the income does change drastically during the year. So that's one thing, you know, getting caught at, in April and there that's, you are. That's why a lot of people fill out the W-4 and ask for zero exemptions. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Maybe some people won't know what a W-4 is. We all know what a W-2 is. Maybe you should tell us about both of them. All right. The W-4 is the form you fill out when you're employed. And on it, you have your name, your social security number, and then a list of allowances. Now, these have nothing to do with the number of exem exemptions or dependents that you'll have when you file your return. But it tells the employer how much to withhold from your paycheck. And there are allowances, for instance, people over 65 have an allowance. Uh, there's an allowance for blindness and so forth. And these other allowances that I mentioned, it can add up to a great many, so that very little is withheld. But then again, you have to be realistic and see what might happen during the year. That may work out perfectly well. Mm -hmm. And you may still get a refund. If you have a lot of itemized deductions, a lot of exemptions, it'd, be, it'd work out well. And the W-2? The W-2 is the little form that we're supposed to get from our employers by January the 31st of every year. And uh, frequently, some employers have been very lax about that. For instance, I'm not pointing any fingers or anything, but I'm just naming this as an example. Um, some fast food chain, chain st um, restaurants that hire seasonal help students during the summer. They probably have a large turnover during the year. Sometimes they're very, very slow about sending out the W-2s, if they do. A lot of times the students... Does an employee have any recourse? Yes, now they do. Uh, it has been the law before now that the <coughs> employer was required. Now there's a $25 penalty if they do not furnish the W-2. So I think that will be strictly enforced from here on out. Let's talk a little bit about married women and, and taxes. Mm -hmm. Is it true that most couples file jointly? Yes. There's a tax advantage. There's a very real tax break. Uh, when you look at your tax tables, you see the different columns. Single people are taxed more heavily than anybody else. You've got the married filing separately. The best category is married filing jointly. The taxes are lower. 
So it's advantageous, but I think every woman should be aware of the fact that when she signs that return, whether she has earned any income at all, she's responsible for every item on that return, even if she's never read it. And I'm afraid there are some wives whose husbands just put it in front of them, the wives sign it, they have no idea what it's about. In fact, it appalls me that some women seem to be proud of the fact that they don't know anything about income tax returns, don't know what their husbands made last year, don't know what the taxes were, don't know anything about it, but they're responsible if their name is on it. Well, you said an interesting thing to me earlier, and, and that is that women can be discriminated against simply because they aren't well informed and they don't inform themselves. Right. They, they certainly should know about that. Uh, for instance, we were discussing divorced women. If they have been filing jointly with their husbands, they should certainly be aware of the fact that they are still responsible for those returns. For instance, if a return is audited, they're still responsible if their names are on it. There's something new this year that uh, married women will be particularly interested in, and that's the child care credit. Mm -hmm, right. Can you explain that so it makes some sense? It is no longer an itemized deduction. You remember on the back of the, on the AB, where you had itemized deductions, there was a line for child care. Now it's a credit against the tax. There is a new form to be filled out, and this year something of importance is that the wife does not have to be working. She can be a student. Uh, as far as that's concerned, the husband can be a student. They could both be students. And there is a formula worked out. They, can, they have to follow the form very closely. And there again, this tax computation. Um, but there is an allowance if a person is a student so much per week as income. She can't have that credit if she's not working, though, or not a student, right? All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There would have to be some. In other words, if she's a woman staying at home full time, obviously there's not going to be a child care credit because she can take care of the child. Right. Also, there's something about domestic help that you think married women ought to know? Right, certainly. Uh, if a woman has domestic help, she certainly is responsible for filing a quarterly return, uh, 940, if, the, um, if she's paying wages of $50 or more. $50 or more? A quarter. A quarter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But go back to the child care um, a second. Is this better, this credit? Is this better than having it be a deduction? Well, one big advantage now, one change that was made, is that there is no income limitation. Previously, if people made over a certain amount, they weren't entitled to it at all. They wouldn't, wouldn't be able to claim it. I think that the changes that have been made, for instance, it says, uh, before it said gainfully employed, now it says seeking employment also, or the student thing, I think is very good. Someone would just have to sit down and work it out. There's still limitations to it. There are still, you have to take the less of certain m amounts and so forth, but if they can take anything at all as a credit, that's to the good. Are there other exemptions for married women who work other than the child care credit that are different this year, or is everything pretty much the same? Everything is pretty much the same. The W-4 <laughs> and the child care are the two most important things, yeah, that have been changed. What about single women? Single people oh. in general are very discriminated against, well, they are, they? There we can't say just single women, except for the fact that there are more of us than there are of them, uh, more single women than men. But there is an organization, a nonprofit organization in Washington that has been lobbying for tax equity. And if anyone questions the fact that this is needed, they should look at the tax tables and the t single people are always taxed more heavily than the married people, married filing jointly especially. And the organization is called COST, Committee of Single Taxpayers. They're at 1628 21st Street, Washington. The zip is 20009. If someone wants to write them and get some information, they have had effect in the past in trying to equalize the taxes and I hope they'll have more in the future because it's very, very difficult for a single person who probably doesn't have exemptions, dependents, uh, who may or may not itemize, who's probably renting and not taking the advantage of mortgage interest uh, tax deductions. Uh, very difficult for them because they are in this high tax bracket, and I think it's unfair. What about the single head of household? The unmarried head of household. Yeah. 
Uh, this is a category into which a lot of widows and divorced women fall. Now, the widows are a special case because during the, in the year in which her husband died, say a woman's husband died in 76, when she files her return in 77, she, if she filed jointly with him, she can file a joint return. And for the next two years, if she meets certain standards, that's uh, qualified to file jointly, if she has a dependent child for whom she maintains a household, if she remains unmarried during the tax year, she can still file in what is, in effect, married filing jointly. And then after that, she and the divorced woman would file as unmarried head of household, and that's in the column two. Uh, it is a tax advantage. Their tax is not as high as those of single women without children. Have there been changes in the estate tax? Yes, and it's all to the good. As you know, uh, until this year, there was a $60,000 exclusion uh, from anyone's estate. In other words, only the amount over 60000 was taxed. That's been raised for seventy-seven to one hundred and twenty thousand six six six, mm -hmm. and by nineteen eighty-one, I think it will be up to one hundred and seventy-five thousand, if I'm not mistaken. It's a great increase, yes, and it will help. I think this was primarily, Sandy, due to the fact that attention was brought to the plight of farm wives, who work alongside of their husbands even more. For instance, another married woman whose husband goes out and works and the married woman stays at home can't be said to have a particular interest in his I'm talking about a financial interest in his business or profession whereas a farm wife does because her labor there with her husband is vital to the operation of the farm so because of this the estate taxes have been changed and it will help them greatly what about buying, you know, going back to married women, what about buying savings bonds for your children? What do you do about those? What do you it's do about good the interest? In, it's a good investment, and it's a question a lot of parents raise. Do I report the interest? Does my child report the interest? What do we do? Okay. What, what is the answer? All right. Well, first of all, we go back to that $750 unearned income. Mm -hmm. uh, when a parent buys a bond for a child, the parent should be named as beneficiary, not co-owner which it goes against everything I've always preached about co-ownership um, in order to avoid estate taxes, but this is a different case. In this way, the parent is not responsible for the payment of taxes on the interest. During the first year in which the bonds are bought, they should file a return in the child's name stating the intent of filing annually if the interest is, is above $750. And that's all there is to it. Mm, that, that's very interesting because I know that's a frequently asked mm -hmm. question. Yeah, right. What about self-employed women? Self-employed women do have a special problem. They're not having taxes withheld from a salary, obviously, since they're self-employed. So they go and they're going to have to pay not only their own taxes, but their Social Security taxes. So they have to fill out some more forms, an ES and an SE. Uh, if uh, woman who has her own business has employees then she'll have to file quarterly returns for the employees a 941 an annual 940 if she's uh, for the unemployment taxes it's pretty complicated but the IRS does help in all cases let's not paint a black picture they will help anyone from a 1040 a on to the more complicated situations and a woman who's opening a business of her own should certainly get publication 334, which is included in the small business, in the business kit. And would you get that by sending to the IRS? And you usually have to go in and pick it up. Sometimes they'll mail it. It depends on the office. But it has all of the information that she would need about filing and keeping records again. Martha, were you on top of the, um, you know, the bills before Congress to provide Social Security for homemakers? Yes, I was very interested in that. It, d it died in committee, as you know. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is there any chance, do you think, for I don't that know. in the future? It would have to be reintroduced. There is a lot of controversy about it. Of course, I think one of the things that killed it was the fact that no one really knew how to implement it. Should it be voluntary? Mm -hmm. Should it be involuntary? Who pays into it? Does the husband, is it matched? There were a lot of unanswered questions. I think it's valid, though, 
because full-time homemakers and 57% of the married women in America still are full-time homemakers, not employed outside the home. They have no disability insurance. They have no Social Security coverage. They're really very unprotected. They're entirely dependent on whatever their husbands can do for them in the way of insurance and so forth. So I hope it will be reintroduced. I hope that it will be worked out so that it is viable and will be passed. What about the displaced homemakers oh, bill? Oh, and when I heard that that was killed in committee, I, I nearly cried. As you know, the California Displaced Homemakers Act was the prototype for the... Um, Maybe we should explain to people exactly what it is. It's a beautiful thing. It really is. It's an act whereby women who, through death or divorce, for instance, are thrust into a life alone, are counseled for that traumatic period immediately after a death or divorce, are help to use their life skills. There again, the homemaker who says, I can't do anything, and she's been doing something all of her life. These women are helped to utilize those in order to earn a living. There's training available. Uh, the, the act is wonderful. I think it's excellent, and I think it's needed nationally. And Barbara Jordan and Yvonne Burke introduced the bill, and it went to committee, and it was killed. I hope they'll reintroduce it, and I'm going to do everything in my power to help its passage because I think it's vitally needed. Someone asked me one time, well, why just for women? Why not for men? The only answer I can say is that a woman who spent her whole life as a homemaker is not prepared to go out and earn a living, whereas a man who has been divorced or whose wife has died has been working. Right, he still has some right. means of income. Now, he probably will have the emotional problems that the woman mm -hmm. has, and I, why not open the centers to them, to the men if needed? Speaking of committees, let, let's talk for a minute about the Ways and Means Committee. They are, are they not, responsible for all of the decisions about our taxes? Mm -hmm. All right, and if you have any problems, if you have any complaints, I would urge anybody to write to them. You, you really think that does some good? Write to the con your own congressman, yeah, and write to the Ways and Means Committee. Why not? I think most people think that the policy is made at the Internal Revenue Service, and no. that's really not no, true. No, 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 uh-uh, no, far from it. The, the tax laws are made in the Ways and Means Committee, and they're given to the Internal Revenue Service to enforce and also to help the public with. You know, we forget sometimes we think of the Internal Revenue Service as a collective service. There are taxpayer service branches, and they're the ones who will help. Let's talk for a second about newly divorced women. Um, lots of women don't realize that alimony is to be counted as income. Right. They certainly don't. They're, very, they're so pleased when they're awarded a large amount of alimony, but it is taxable to them tax deductible for the husband. Uh, now, child care is not taxable. Meet child support. Child support, I'm sorry. Child support is not taxable, so I would urge a woman, if she has a choice and has children, by all means take child support instead of There's all also means. sometimes some confusion as to which parent can claim the child as, as a dependent. Mm -hmm, right. w what are the guidelines for that? The guidelines have not been changed this year, especially, except in one sense, and it's a very important sense. Here to four, if the decree did not state which parent could take the child as, a, as an exemption, as a dependent, usually the custodial parent was able to claim him or her. However, if the non-custodial parent contributed so much per year, per child, and the decree stated it, then he could claim it. Uh, the amount this year has been changed for 1977. It's something that I think all men and women facing divorce or having gotten a divorce should think about and go and consider very carefully. Now the husband or the non-custodial parent will have to contribute $1,200 a year per child. And that can amount up when there are quite a few children. What about filing jointly after a divorce? The year of the divorce, yes. well, I would advise against it definitely. W why would you? There again, the wife is going to be responsible for that if she signs it. 
And if there is an audit, she's going to be responsible. If taxes are due, she's going to be responsible. If there's a penalty or interest, she's going to be responsible. And I really don't think, oh, what is she doing? She's helping him to file in a lower tax bracket by filing jointly with him. And I think there are too many disadvantages to it. If, if you are divorced and your <coughs> husband supports you totally, um, he's not entitled to claim you as an exemption. Is mm -mm. that right? That's right. Uh, uh, no, as an exemption. You are not. He can claim you as an exemption, but not a dependent. A right. wife is never a dependent. An exemption. Right. Right. We, we talked a little bit about Social Security for homemakers, mm -hmm. but I, I'm not sure that we made absolutely clear the ways that the women are discriminated against in, in the Social Security benefits. Can we talk particularly about widows? Are there ways that the widows are, are discriminated against? Not the, not the single heads of household and, and the other people. Well, widows who don't have children really are just thrown into the category of singles, single taxpayers. I don't think Social Security payments for the woman who starts claiming them herself are adequate. Would you advise women in that situation to write letters? Oh, surely. In all situations, huh? Yeah. Martha, we're out of time. I thank you for the information. Thank you. And thank you for watching, and good night.